The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kevin Bergerson, and I am the Patient Education Program Senior Coordinator for the Colon Cancer Alliance. And on behalf of all of the Colon Cancer Alliance, and in particular, our certified patient navigators and patient support team from the Colon Cancer Alliance, I would like to welcome you to tonight's webinar, EGFR Inhibitors Rash Management Prevention is the Key. This is the 12th installment of the, colon, of the Conversations About Colon Cancer webinar series. And we here at the Colon Cancer Alliance have created that webinar series to provide attendees with the opportunity to link with national experts in the colorectal field uh, together in an exciting online uh, mechanism that we have called our Conversations webinar series. A little bit about tonight's webinar. If you have metastatic colorectal cancer, you might be eligible for drugs that inhibit the binding of proteins that tell cancer cells how to grow. These inhibitor type drugs are given intravenously based on a patient's height and weight and overall general health. This evening, we will discuss EGFR inhibitors and how to manage any side effects should they occur. Just a real quick note here about questions. This is an interactive webinar, so after our speaker has finished presenting, we may be able to address a few of the questions as posed by you, the attendees, during our webinar. Please note that we will only be accepting questions posed online using the webinar control panel. To submit a question for consideration, please uh, look for the small plus sign next to the word questions on the webinar control panel and click on that little plus sign. That little control panel is on the right side of your screens. Then type in question, type your question in, and hit enter. Please accept my apologies in advance. If any questions that you ask don't get answers, we're going to do everything we can to answer those. But we want you to remember that our webinar presenters are here to answer uh, your questions, and they're willing to do so with the best of their ability. But please remember, our presenters are here to inform only, and any specific questions regarding your individualized treatment should be discussed with your personal clinician and healthcare teams. And with that, I'm going to introduce our speaker for this evening. Our presenter tonight is Eden Stotsky Hemelfar. Eden is a nurse clinician in the Department of Surgery at John Hopkins Hospital. She is also a 14 year survivor of stage three rectal cancer. All right. That's the kind of stuff I like to hear. Eden is a graduate of John Hopkins University with a Bachelor of Science in Nursing. She's worked for six and a half years as a health educator for John Hopkins Colon Cancer Center before becoming a registered nurse. She is currently part of the Gastrointestinal Surgical Oncology Group at John Hopkins, where she works with patients who have a variety of gastrointestinal cancers, including colorectal cancer. Ms. Uh, Ms. Stotsky Himmelfarb assisted in bringing the Prevent Cancer Foundation's Dialogue for Action to Maryland in 2005 and was an integral part of the development and implementation of the Baltimore City Colorectal Cancer Screening Demonstration Program. As, as a past member of the Board of Directors of the Ullman Cancer Fund for Young Adults, she currently volunteers for the organization and is on the planning committee for the John Hopkins Pediatric Oncology Camp Sunrise. One of her most Favorite projects is the One Bite at a Time cookbook created for cancer patients and their patients and friends and families. Since being diagnosed with colorectal cancer at the age of 26, Eden's goal has been to spread the word about the importance of screening for colorectal cancer at the appropriate age. And with that, I'm going to turn the control of the webinar over to you, Eden. Uh, welcome. Great. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you for asking me to do the webinar tonight, and hello to everyone who is listening. It's my pleasure to be here tonight, and I just like would like to thank the Colon Cancer Alliance and their entire staff for all that they do for patients with colorectal cancer. I can speak firsthand to the fact when I was diagnosed in 1997 that the Colon Cancer Alliance was the first place that I went, and they... Um, 
they held my hand through through my experience and I'm forever forever grateful to them and in debt to them so thank you again so yes I am here tonight to talk to you about EGFR inhibitors and there are two of them that we know um, that we that we think about the most and that is Herbitux and Vectibix and Herbitux is also known as Cetuximab and Vectibix is also known as Panitumumab um, and so I, I know that each and every one of you on this call know whether or not you're taking one of these drugs and what I'm here to talk to you about tonight is rash management and the, and the key to, to managing rash management is prevention so prevention is key um, I'd like to start off by giving you a little bit of science and biology and then we'll get into the meat of the discussion. Uh, EGFR is located on tumor cells and many skin cells and when the growth factors bind to the receptors they tell the cell to divide and grow. Herbituxin and Vectibix block the ligands from or growth factors from binding, therefore shutting down the growth and signaling cell death, which in the case of cancer cells, that's what we want to do. We want to kill the cells, but they don't know whether or not to, they don't know which are cancer cells and which are good cells, so they tend to sometimes, or many times, kill a lot of the cells, including including skin cells, which is what we're going to talk about tonight. And this is a diagram that shows you just how uh, Vectibix and, Herb and Herbitux work against the, the um, receptors and you can see how they start and they, and they work through the KRAS and the BRAF and the MEK, excuse me, and the ERK and w at which point they get to uh, the nuclear sig signaling. Excuse me. And here's another diagram that shows you a little bit about the, um, the the inhibitors and and shows you specifically this KRAS and so what I want to bring to your attention about KRAS is that it's very important to know that these these drugs so Herbitux and Vectibix only work on patients who do not and I repeat do not have a certain genetic mutation and and have normal KRAS tumors so normal we also call wild type and that can sometimes be very confusing because when you think of wild type you don't necessarily think of normal but wild type in this situation if you have a wild type tumor you actually have a normal KRAS tumor and it's important for you to know that these drugs can work for you if that is what your tumor test says. So again it's important to get your tumor tested if you haven't already gotten it tested and know that these drugs only work on patients who have normal KRAS tumors. Okay, so wild type tumors. Here's another diagram um, to show you a little bit about the receptors and where KRAS and BRAF fit in. <clears throat> and so why, why is skin important? Skin is the largest, largest organ. Many people don't think of skin as an organ, but in fact it is. It acts as a barrier to keep out fungus and bacteria. Um, it regulates our temperature. It produces vitamin D. And since EGFR is in skin cells, the blockage by these inhibitors causes death of normal cells, which I was discussing before. So it causes death of normal epidermal cells. So you see why skin is so incredibly important. So typically the, the first sign that you're, you're going to see that potentially these, these drugs are affecting your skin is something we call acneform rash. And it occurs within the first month and it typically occurs on the face, the chest, and the scalp. And it really is, um, what it is, is it's, it's, a, it's a very bad form of acne. So for those of you that might remember being a teenager when you were going through puberty and you had the acne, that's exactly what it is. So and it usually that's the first sign and it usually occurs within the first month again on the face, the chest and the scalp. And it can be severe in in approximately 40% of the people and you can see the picture on the slide before as well as this picture, um, you can see where the chest and the face are severely 
severely affected. So dry skin um, is, is one thing that we try to prevent. So again, prevention is key. So we want to prevent dry skin. So it's important to keep the skin very moist because if the skin is broken down, then it can allow for penetration of bacteria, which then can unfortunately lead to perhaps an infection. So what are some other skin toxicities during treatment? So, so we really think of skin, when we think of skin, we think of our skin that covers our entire body. But skin toxicities can also affect your hair, meaning that your hair could thin, it could, it could fall out, it could actually be overgrowing in the case of, of the eyelashes. Sometimes the eyelashes grow so much that they actually curl. Um, there can also be nail changes, so nail um, nails are part of the skin, and there we can see brittle nails. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, if there's separation from the nail bed, there could be an infection because oftentimes bacteria live underneath our nails. Um, and 90% of people will develop skin toxicities within the first month, so that's a pretty high percentage. So it's important that that you take into account these prevention techniques. So the skin toxicities, when they occur, will be less severe than they possibly could have been. So all patients, again, this, this idea of prevention is key. All patients should be treated prophylactically to prevent the rash. Preventing the side effect, meaning these skin toxicities, should be handled like we handle nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. So it's it's just like any other any other side effect. It should be managed similarly to that and, and taken very seriously. So we, we typically think uh, prophylactic treatments for, for weeks one to six when you're on treatment. An antibiotic from the tetracycline family twice a day for six weeks. Um, again for treatment the first six weeks weeks one to six. And then of course if you're going to be out in the sun, so sunscreen um, and apply before going outdoors in every two hours. And a lot of people think that, um, uh, first of all, a lot of people forget to reapply, so it's very, it's very important to reapply. Second of all, a lot of people believe that, oh well it's not warm enough uh, outside for me to put on sunscreen, but typically if the sun is out, you should be wearing sunscreen. The temperature shouldn't matter as much as whether or not the sun is out. <clears throat> So what, what are some skin pretreatments that we can do? So we can apply moisturizers to uh, the face, hands, feet, your back, neck, scalp, while your skin is still damp. So it's important to do it when you, let's say when you get out of the shower and instead of rubbing your skin, you pat your skin and then put on a moisturizer that is fragrance free, of course. And the, again, the best time to do it is while your skin is still damp. Another way to pretreat the skin are topical steroids. So for the face, we usually use a cream that has a low dose steroid. For the scalp, we usually use a higher, a higher do dose, excuse me, and an ointment. And for the body, we use a lotion that again has a higher dose of the steroid in it. And again, these are all pretreatments, things that you should do before you notice that the skin perhaps is breaking down. So guidelines for moisturizing, some things that you can do um, to help keep your skin very moist and prevent it from breaking down. Again, the, prevent, the key here is prevention. So short, lu lukewarm baths or showers, wear loose clothing, um, lower your heat in the home to a point where you can still remain warm, but not it's not super hot. Pat your skin, don't rub it, like I was mentioning, pat it, don't rub it and use fragrance-free soap and laundry detergent. So it's very important that you use fragrance-free, even dishwash when you're washing the dishes, so that soap, hand soap, body soap, any kind of soap that you use in your house, if you, you can use fragrance-free, that's the best way to go. And laundry detergent, so the free and clear laundry detergents is the best thing, best thing to use. And of course avoid anything that's alcohol-based, any alcohol-based skincare products, avoid those. Um, and get treated to prevent 
the rash when treatment starts. So again, you're going to start this prophylactic treatment at the beginning of your treatment with an EGFR inhibitor um, so, you can, so you can prevent the rash from actually ever happening. So more tips to help manage the rash. Um, you may possibly be able to use an antihistamine. Of course, you want to talk to your doctor before using an antihistamine, topical or oral. Drink plenty of fluids, which will keep your body hydrated and your skin moist. Um, don't shave your face or your legs um, if skin reactions occur, just to give your skin a rest. And of course, like I said, bacteria loves to live under fingernails and toenails, so keep them clean and dry. Don't bite your nails or cut your cuticles. If you go for a manicure or pedicure, make sure they're using um, equipment um, that, that's been cleaned and sterilized. Um, eyelashes may grow long, so they might bother you. Um, that's just something that if you can manage to curl them up so they don't get in your eyes, which most of the time they do that anyway. That's the best way to go. And hair changes may occur. So you may, the hair may thin or fall out, but hopefully these changes will resolve on their own after the treatment starts. Stops, I mean, excuse me, not starts, stops. Okay, so thing, uh, additional things that you can do while undergoing EGFR inhibitor therapy. Um, moisturize your skin multiple times throughout the day. So not just once in the morning, once at night. Carry it with you, and perhaps after you go to the bathroom and wash your hands and your hands are still damp, then put the moisturi moisturizer on again, making sure it's fragrance and dye die free. Um, again, use sun protection. Reapply throughout the day as much as you can. Carry that with you. Um, limit sun exposure by wearing long sleeve shirts and pants and wear a, a hat that is meant for the sun, not just a baseball cap, but a hat that has a brim all the way around. Um, wear rubber or cotton lined gloves when washing dishes or cleaning or even potentially doing the laundry sometimes because you're picking up wet, um, wet clothing. And of course, use mild soaps when washing the skin, but make sure that they are fragrance free and dye free. Um, what I always tell my patients is to kind of have a, uh, um, a bag that you take with you, and I, I like to call it sort of your your treatment kit, so to speak. And you can have in there um, sun sunscreen, lotion for your hands, um, perhaps a hat if you're not if you may not need to wear it all day long, um, even the rubber or cotton line gloves because just depending on where you may find yourself, it's always good to, to carry those things. And also um, the, the socks for the feet too, the socks that, um, that are, are sort of the therapeutic socks that, that will allow a moisturizer to be moisturized into your, into your feet. So things to avoid while you're undergoing EGFR inhibitor therapy, um, again, skin products with any perfumes, dyes, or alcohol. Don't use any over-the-counter acne medications or creams um, or gels, even though I did say to you that this is an acne-type rash, you want to make sure that you get a prescription from the doctor, not, not don't use anything over-the-counter, um, or use a skin product that has no perfumes, dyes, or alcohol, but you want to make sure that you ask your nurse or your doctor first if it's okay to be using what you're using. You don't want to use any strong soaps or detergents. And this is an interesting one. You don't want to wear tight shoes, which may irritate your feet or toenails. So loose shoes um, with those special socks if you can. Um, and sun exposure, UV light exposure from sun tanning lamps or beds. Um, you definitely don't want to go to a tanning salon um, or be out in the sun for any any extended period of time with any without any kind of protection. And you don't want to use artificial or acrylic nails. <clears throat> So, of course, and I'm sure that you hear this um, from your doctors and your nurses quite frequently, you should contact your doctor uh, immediately if you experience any shortness of breath, fever, wheezing, swelling of the face, feelings that your throat is closing up or difficulty in breathing. And actually, I would recommend that you contact your doctor but also call 911 if any of these symptoms occur. And so, and post, so once you finish with the EGFR inhibitors, um, there are 
some effects that you may see afterwards and particularly in fair skin individuals you may see um, post-inflammatory redness so just the skin is red not necessarily the rash the acne type rash but it can be treated with topical medicine or laser treatment for darker skin individuals you may see post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation which may last for for actually quite a while but it can be that can also be treated with lasers or topical bleaching agents and again it's very 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 important to treat these things prophylactically so if you do notice that that you're having these kinds of post treatment effects it's important to talk to a dermatologist um, about what you can do to treat these these effects prophylactically and and one thing that I neglected to mention before at the beginning of the, of the discussion is that it's very important that you find a good dermatologist um, most of the time medical oncologists and their staff can manage these rashes but um, it's always always helpful to have a really good dermatologist that can help with medicines um, so you can remain on treatment for as long as you possibly can. Let the medical oncologist focus on the EGFR inhibitors and let the dermatologist focus on, on the, the rash and the, and the skin side effects. So again, and this is with any kind of side effect, what are the consequences of untreated side effects? So not just skin rash, but also nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation. Um, they're, they're, it, it affects you psychosocially, it affects you financially, it affects you physically, your overall quality of life is affected, and perhaps sometimes there's disruption in treatment because you didn't treat the side effects quick enough or fast enough or soon enough to be able to con to be able to remain on treatment and not have a break in the in the treatment so thank you again for your time tonight I look forward to your questions my email address is here if anyone would like to contact me directly again I do work at Hopkins um, with the GI oncology groups in surgery and medical oncology and um, I would be happy to answer any questions that you have and again also I, I have no problem being contacted directly after the webinar is over so thank you again All right. Well, thank you, Eden. That was great. I um, appreciate that. We've already got a number of questions that have started to come in. But before I get to any questions, I'd be very remiss if I didn't take a moment to thank our um, sponsor, Lily Oncology, uh, for sponsoring our webinar tonight. We couldn't do this without their invaluable support. So thank you, Lily Oncology. Um, our questions are starting to come in. Um, it looks like we have a number that we could start with. I'd like to start with a question from Catherine, who asks, um, I read this drug is effective when taken with chemotherapy, and, and she's on three different chemotherapy drugs, apparently, mm -hmm. um, and including she's on Iranotecan for 30 minutes. Uh, will Herbitex still be effective with that course of treatment? Yes, so I, I can, I'm happy to answer that question. And yes, Herbitux can be given with other, with chemotherapy as well as on its own. Um, but in order to really get a, a good handle on the effectiveness as far as if you're looking for any kind of statistics or for your particular um, stage of cancer, it would be best to talk to your medical oncologist about that. But in general, the general answer to your question is, all right, thank you. I have another question now from Kara, and she would like to know, how is it determined that an EGFR inhibitor is needed in cancer patients? Okay, so in, in particular with patients who have colorectal cancer, EGFR inhibitors only work on patients who do not have a certain genetic mutation and have normal KRAS tumors. And so your tumor, whether it be from a biopsy or from surgery, needs to be tested for KRAS. So it needs to be tested to find out if it's normal or if it's abnormal. And if it's normal, also known as wild type, then you would benefit from using an EGFR inhibitor Herbitux and or Vectibix. If it is KRAS mutant, meaning that 
you do have the genetic mutation, then you would not benefit from using an EGFR inhibitor, Arbitux or Vectavix. Interesting. Uh, just off the top of your head, do you happen to know if there's any um, plus delta life expectancy benefit for the Arbitux? Um, I do believe that there is, again, yes, yes, but only if um, you don't have the certain genetic mutation, so. Okay, and we have, uh, we have our next question comes to us from uh, Facebook. Her name's Tricia, and we kind of got a little relay going here from three or four different people forwarding her question to us. Mm -hmm. uh, Trish, Trisha has asked that uh, she has, you know, terrible acne on Herbitux. You know, okay. it's on, she says it's on her face, but also on her chest and on her back. And the doctor has given her a oral antibiotic and a 1% cream. Is there anything else or any other ideas that she should try, other, you know, other than what we've outlined in the presentation this evening? Okay, it appears to be we've had a little bit of a technological problem here with the uh, with our our uh, presenter. Uh, so what we're going to to do at this time is we're, we're going to give her a second to uh, come back in. Eden, can you hear us? So unfortunately, it sounds like we've had a little bit of a, a technological issue challenge with our presenter. There is Eden. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, we're back. Sorry. All right. Okay. So I'm sorry, did you say that she's on an oral antibiotic and a 1% cream? Yes, and she wanted to know if there's anything else she could do. So I think following some of the tips that we outlined here would be, there. those are obviously a lot of things that if she followed those on a daily basis, perhaps maybe the cream could be, the percentage cream could be, increased and or an oral antibiotic could be changed. So those would be things that I would talk to. Does she have a good dermatologist? So so I would recommend a good dermatologist to discuss those issues with. Okay. And I have a question now from Adam. Uh, Adam has uh, several questions here in a row. He says uh, Herbitux is great and, and shrunk his tumor in half and reduced his CAA in a dramatic faction. That's good stuff there, Adam. I've heard studies, he says, that correlate the severity of the rash with the effectiveness of Herbitux. Um, he mentions that there's mincycline versus uh, docycline, uh, tropical antibiotic versus moisture lotion. Um, he's also read some studies that are looking at the link between chocolate and acne. He's wondering if the Herb effects also affects acne uh, like rash, if, if something else is going on there. So, so I'm not sure that I understand the question. So is he asking if, if the Herbitux causes the rash? Is that what he's? I think it, it's kind of, it's kind of hard the way it was phrased to us, but it looks like if there's any correlation between the severity of the rash and the effect in this or the Herbitux. Yes, so the answer to that is yes, there have been studies that show that the severity, the more severe the rash, the more effective the Herbitux. Okay, and I, uh, Adam, if, I do apologize if I didn't get to the heart of your question. Please uh, post it at the very end, and I'll, be, I'll come right back to it if we still have time. Our next question is from Elizabeth, and Elizabeth has said that uh, she, her husband has been on Vectavix for about eight months, and his doctor is still prescribing menocycline, uh, which is an acne antibiotic. You mentioned taking something in the first one to six weeks. Um, is it helping at this point? His, his rash is leveled out. Yes, absolutely. It is still helping. Um, yes, because I imagine that if he wasn't on it, that it potentially could get worse. And I did mention the one to six weeks, meaning that that's when treatment should start. But the treatment should not end until the drug ends. Okay. Very good. Next question we have is from Kobe. Uh, you know, prior to taking Vectavix for the first time, uh, was taking 
uh, do uh, docycline drastically to reduce his RAS system. Is there any uh, uh, anything we could do differently for his uh, rash symptoms that are a result of docycline? Um, so I, I think again, going back to some of the the tips that we discussed during this um, during this webinar, uh, and following them really, really to the T, like reapplying the the moisturizers, especially when the skin is wet. That's the biggest thing that you can do multiple times a day. Every time you go to the bathroom and wash your hands and take a shower, and so really the reapplication and and potentially sometimes changing the the antibiotic of course keeping it in the tetracycline family but changing it to a different one sometimes makes a difference miracle and and a, just a follow-up to the vesabix um treatment are there any are you aware of any long-term side effects of the vesabix with organs and other parts of the body um as far as other organs or other parts of the body i don't know the answer to okay. that question um but of course, skin is skin is one of our organs, and there can be long-term effects and redness, which we discussed. But I don't know about other organs. And any suggestions to address nail brittleness? Hmm. Yeah, that's a um, that's a tough one because it, you obviously can't put cream on your nails, or um, yeah. So as far as the nail brittleness goes, there's nothing to nothing that you can do to address the actual brittleness but it's so important to keep your hands clean and your nails clean and underneath your nail beds clean and just be careful that they don't separate away the nails separate from the fingers because then those all become sites of infection okay and uh, just have a few more questions here uh ari would well, like to know that uh had a small little breakout with the Vectavix. Do um, you think it's safe to use uh, witch hail, aloe? Are there other foods they should avoid while on these drugs that you're aware of? Um, I don't know of any foods that they should um, avoid while on an EGFR inhibitor. Now, I, I'm thinking that she might be asking about witch hazel and I'm not sure if that's what she's asking about, but I would definitely, before doing, before using any alternative type of treatment, it's important to discuss it with your medical oncologist. Yeah, that, yes, it was the witch hazel, yes. Yeah. And, so just important uh, to discuss that with, with your medical oncologist. Okay. And uh, Kobe has a, a couple of... Uh, um, Couple of follow-up questions. He wants to. He mentioned that there has been some studies about docycline prior to taking Vectavix for the first time has reduced rash symptoms by 50%. But he was wondering about any long-term side effects of taking the docycline, um, doxycline. Um, you know, is there any no, no mention of diet to treat rash symptoms? Anything along diet to treat rash symptoms? Yeah, that's a follow-up diet question. Sure. So no, nothing that, that I'm aware of as far as um, diet to treat rash symptoms and as far as long-term effects from the cycling drugs, um, because it is an antibiotic, um, of course, there can be GI distress. There can be C. diff, um, which is a bacterial infection in the intestine if you take antibiotics for too long. So those are those are two um, long-term side effects that, that I know of, but they shouldn't last beyond the treatment. Um, as far as any other side effects, I would talk either to your medical oncologist or it's always, it's always a possibility to talk to a pharmacist to, about that as well. Okay, thank you. That was... That was very informative. Uh, got one last question here from Kobe. Uh, um, excuse me, from Ari, uh, who has multiple mouth sores from mm -hmm. taking the Vectavix. Any suggestions on t how to prevent the little mouth sores? Yeah, so those mouth sores are, I'm sorry, they're so painful. Um, um, so there is a mouthwash that you can use. Um, that is prescription strength, and so I would recommend asking your medical oncologist for the mouthwash. Um, and of course, um, 
you know, eating eating foods that irritate the sores. I'm sure it's not something that you're doing because it's probably very painful to eat. Um, I would just stay away from anything that, that, that makes it feel worse, any foods that make it feel worse, which I would imagine you're already doing. But the biggest thing would be to get the mouthwash and to ask your medical oncologist for that. All right. We're just we're just about done here. Uh, Kobe would like to share that he he's found some success with mouth sores using baking soda and warm water. Um, yes, that is a that is a good remedy as well. Very yep. Good. And uh, do we have any um, ideas for maybe a good sh uh, scalp shampoo? Uh, Adam is wondering, you know, if there's anything that might be alleviating some of those types of things. He he says Aquaphor works good, but is there anything else? For a moisture. Yeah, Aquaphor is actually the best, and so I'm so happy to hear that he's already using that. Um, anything that is fragrance-free, dye-free, um, anything, you know, it, it's good to, to look perhaps in like a Whole Foods or a, or a Trader Joe's or, or a health food store for any kind of shampoo that doesn't have any fragrances, any dyes. They're really hard to find, and so, um, but that would be best, and that would be helpful. Um, for for the scalp, which again the aquaphor is the best, being that it's an ointment. So. All righty. Well, um, we we're kind of uh, we've handled all the questions that we have out there, and we have just a few more minutes. So, but but I I wanted to thank everyone for your questions. Um, and not hearing any more questions, uh, I just want to remind everybody that uh, um, I'd very much like to thank. Um, Eden, on behalf of the Colon Cancer Alliance, for being our presenter this evening. And, sure. You know, and again, mention Lily for their sponsorship. We couldn't do this without you guys. It, 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 we sure do appreciate. We, we value your expertise and time. It's greatly appreciated. Any parting comments, Eden? No, just saying again, thank you to, well, yes, thank you to CCA for doing these webinars. They're so very important to get information out to um, patients and their family members. And again, I'm happy to be a resource, so don't hesitate to contact me directly at my email address. Very good, very good. And uh, what was your email address one more time? Sure, it's Eden, my first name, E-D-E-N, at J-H-M-I dot E-D-U. Perfect. Um, the slide you're looking at now, uh, folks, is just a reminder that about this time tomorrow, you all get a follow-up email, automated email from me, uh, with a link to our feedback survey about this particular webinar. We take the input that we get from those surveys very seriously. Um, we're always valuing your opinion, and we're looking to hear your honest feedback on how we can make these better. Um, we're very interested in hearing your ideas about future topics as well. A bunch of our topics for 2016 are coming directly from the webinar survey, so I please encourage you to get, um, when you see that email, to click on that survey and give us your feedback, and I want to thank you in advance for doing so. Um, I'd like to put a little plug in here for our uh, patient navigators on our helpline. If you have any follow-up questions about this topic or on this presentation or other colorectal cancer uh, topics, Please feel free to call our patient navigators on our colon cancer helpline at 877-422-2030. Um, we're almost done, but before we go, don't forget to join us at our next month's webinar, November 18th, for understanding sedation options for your colonoscopy. That's going to be at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, registrations will be opening soon on our website. Um, look for that soon, and we'll also be promoting that on our Blue Hope Nation Facebook page. And lastly, uh, just uh, we're putting our national conference on. It's coming out next week. We're heading west to the beautiful southwest Sonoran Desert in Phoenix, Arizona. Well, we hope to see you there. It's our national conference. It happens once a year. And it's going to be our Live, Life, Live Your Best Life conference, October 3031. Register now at colancancerconference.org. I'd like, at this time, I'd like to once again thank everyone for attending. We surely hope you enjoyed this webinar, and we hope that you found it informative and useful. Um, if you'd like to share your comments with me regarding the webinar, answer the survey, or you can always, uh, always find me by email at kbergerson at ccalliance.org. So on behalf of the Colon Cancer Alliance, our incredible sponsor, Lily Oncology, and our fantastic presenter, Eden, 
I would like to once thank, thank you all once again for attending this webinar. I hope you found it inform, informative, of value added, and I want everybody to have a good evening. Take care, and thanks for attending.